Good afternoon from London. Uh, I think I should say good evening in Palestine and good morning in the US. I'm not entirely sure about the time in the US, but it's probably morning. Uh, my name is Noor Masalha, and I'm a Palestinian academic and historian. And let me begin by a big thank you to the organizers of the um, Palestine Literature Festival and to Susan and all the colleagues. I mean, I know you have worked so hard on this. Um, and um, we have about 45 minutes. Um, I'm actually told that it could be extended to, to about an hour, a whole hour. So this should be very interesting. And it, I'm, I'm really excited to have Salman, um, Dr. Salman Abu Sitti with us this um, afternoon. Salman does not need an introduction. Uh, he's one of our best authors and activists, uh, and he's a truly global phenomena. I think we have very few people like Salman who is really a global figure, actually, in that sense. Uh, Salman and I met about 27, 28 years ago in London after I published my book. I think he reminded me last time we went in London. And since, what well, it must have been about 93. Um, and I remember even the hotel and the lobby we met in London. And since then, Salman and I have been publishing books, but we have done it separately. I think this is one of the things I do regret that we haven't actually published a single book together with Salman. But maybe we will at one point. But we have been working in parallel about the same issues or some of the same issues, some of the same themes um, since the early 90s. Um, and uh, Salman has published several books, and I have also published a number of books on the Nakba, 1948. What I, lo I love about this title, um, it's, it's the um, autobiographical side of it, mapping my, ma uh, ma mapping my return, a Palestinian memoir. It's, um, it's got so many things in it. But let me begin by saying something about my own work, which is kind of parallel uh, to Salman. I published my book in, in 1992 on, on the Nakba and the expulsion of the Palestinians. And since then, I have published a number of books also related to the Nakba, to the right of return, to the Palestinian refugee issue. Um, and one of my books, I think it was 2003, was about the politics of denial. Really, I mean, the heart of Zionism is denial. It's, the, it's not just the theft of our country, the theft of our history, of our towns and villages and land, and our cultural memory, but also denial, denial of the theft of Palestine, denial of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, denial of our right to Palestine, denial of our rights in Jerusalem. Denial is really at the heart of the Zionist enterprise. Uh, and and this is where we uh, we started to 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 resist this denial. Um, what I will do this afternoon is to take you through some of the themes of this book, uh, the big themes of this book, fairly chronologically, <clears throat> from before the Nakba um, into the 50s, 60s, 70s, and into some of the main projects and man has been working on. And um, I mean, I read this book twice, um, a few years ago, 2016, when it was published, I read it more recently to try to sort of refresh my memory. And Salman said he was expelled at the age of 11. And at the age of 11, people actually remember many things about. He was expelled, expelled from a village in the South, not far from Bir Saber, Bir Shiba, called Ma'in. I think actually the first time I heard about Ma'in was, was through Salman. Um, and we have, we Palestinian historians have documented a lot about um, the north of Palestine, a lot about the Galilee, a lot about atrocities in the Galilee, but we haven't done enough about the south. And Salman is the, perhaps the first one to, to remind us that documenting what happened in the south is incredibly important. So now at the age of 11, 
you were driven out from Maine and you ended up as a refugee. What do you remember about before 1948? Can I ask you this question? Of course, of course. Let me first say that uh, I'm very pleased that uh, I'm holding this conversation with you, um, noting that not only you are Palestinian, but you are Palestinian historian who wrote so many things, so many books and papers about an Nakba. You saved me the trouble of explaining so many things if I speak to an American or uh, English person who is studying an Nakba. I don't have to do rebuttal or explanation of uh, various things. It's very obvious to you though. So that's a, a great relief. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to, to talk with me on this. Now, Al Ma'in uh, is um, Al Ma'in Abu Sitta, actually, as it's written in Alimbi in, uh, uh, maps, uh, uh, is 55,000 dunams, which is uh, 15 hectares. It's located technically administratively in Beersheba district, but it's mm -hmm. only eight kilometers from the Mediterranean. And it is now at the edge of the so called armistice line. In other words, if Israel retreated five or 10 kilometers, we would be uh, free. Um, mm. We lived in this uh, uh, Al Ma'in, um, which is, has a Roman name called Al Ma'on. Um, uh, we have actually uh, remains of a monastery uh, uh, in Byzantine times um, in the fourth century. We call it Sheikh Nuran. Um, and um, we uh, planted wheat and uh, barley, and in the summer we have uh, maize, and if we have also fruits and gardens and so on. We were comfortable enough to feed ourselves. Um, and also, uh, my family, like many others, have been leading in the struggle against the British um, mandate. So in 1940, 1938, November, we expelled the British completely from uh, Beersheba district. We took over control of Beersheba town and set up a national rule of Palestinians for one year from uh, nine, November 1938 till November 1939 when the British returned. And so uh, after that, we have also um, fighting uh, uh, people who resisted uh, the um, onslaught of the Zionist uh, uh, colonies. Uh, let me say uh, one thing which is stuck in my mind, I can never forget it, that um, although we heard about Jews in and around Jaffa and Haifa, I have never seen before 1940 any Jew in my life. I don't know how they look like. I don't know what they speak, um, they, our land, in southern Palestine was almost devoid of any Zionist colonies. So it, as a child, when they started attacking us, I was surprised, uh, why is this? And who are these people? What language they speak? What they look like? Why did they come from afar to attack us and destroy our life? I mean, actually, this is one of the main motivations for me in later life in the 70 years after to inquire who are these people? Why are they here? And what, they, what is their motive? Why did they do this to us? And of course, it follows from that, I will not accept that uh, situation. And one trying in many ways. Uh, uh, my, my family were instrumental in setting up the PLO and, um, and the Palestinian National Council. Uh, myself, I was student in Cairo, then in London, and um, then in many other parts of the world, but we never lost uh, sight of uh, our homeland and ways to um, retrieve it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm helped here by my engineering background. It helped a lot. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you there, are, there are many Salmans. There's the Salman, the engineer, there is the Salman, the historian, there is the Salman, as a member of the Palestinian National Council. There are many Salmans, but also there's Salman who really put the whole issue of the practicalities of return on the map. I mean, I mean, we in the 80s struggled to put the denial of the Nakba on the map. We wanted to 
show the Nakba, we wanted to bring it back, and we actually succeeded in many ways, by the way. I mean, people talk about the failures of the Palestinians. I think when I came to London in 1982, no one mentioned Palestine or the Nakba, and now we're talking about it. I think we have achieved something, we have done quite a lot. But I think you went further beyond that and um, started to look at um, the whole question of return and restorations and the practicalities. I think you are one of the few people I should say that the, the right of return is not just sacred, but it's also practical and feasible. Precisely mm -hmm. at the time when the PLO, when the um, um, Oslo process came out with this idea, this is a marginal issue, we should be building a Palestinian state and we should be concentrating on state building. You said, no, we should be first beginning with, uh, with, uh, with the roots, with 1948, with the question of, with the, if you like, the roots of the conflict, rather than actually starting from the, from the end, we should start from the beginning. Um, but I want to take you again, actually, to 1948 and some of the things you mentioned in 1948, and this actually to do with the way we record the history of 1940. You mentioned a massacre at Borer. It's another mm. village in the south, and it's a village, it's a massacre Arif al Arif that does not mention, and early Palestinian historians of the Nakba do not mention. And you wrote about it in this book. And we now we're discovering more and more atrocities about 1948. We do it through oral history. We do it in a way we are going beyond what Arif al Arif did. And he was a great author, um, truly seminal author. But you actually documented that massacre at Burer. Uh, and was it through oral history? Was it through talking to people? Was it through meeting people from Burer? How did you do it? Um, well, th thank you. Let me first make a quick comment about being historian or geographer or something. Um, you know, uh, um, excuse me saying that, but I'm described a number of things. Uh, but I tell people, um, look, the main uh, motivation I have that I have a homeland and a home person home uh, I'm trying to get it back so mm -hmm. if someone takes away your home um, then you need a paper to show that it's your home so you become legal person you need to know where your house is so become a geographer you need to know who lived there and prove that you have been living there before so become a historian and so a refugee trying to return home has to be armed with all these disciplines and probably a lot more. Now, coming, uh, coming to your question about Burer, you are absolutely right. I'm amazed um, how the massacre of Burer, uh, which has significance I'm going to comment on, um, was ignored. Um, first of all, <clears throat> my father bought, uh, brought, uh, built a school at his expense in 1920. Um, and uh, which was not really very much encouraged by the British. Anyway, the last uh, teacher in this school, 1948, um, was a man from Burair. His name is Sheikh Muhammad Abuliya, a Azhar graduate. And um, we knew him, he was a very nice man, good hearted and so on. And then um, he became a refugee. And um, in the very same, uh, almost, uh, at the same time, actually 13th of May, 1948, the um, Zionists or militia Haganah, they were not called Israelis then, they were no Israel at the time, um, attacked that village from three sides and bombard them with um, cannon and uh, with tanks, fire, and uh, uh, they actually um, surrounded the village and as usual left one side which on the north side opened for them to flee. But before that happened, um, they went into every house and they threw hand grenades on a family and each family huddled together in one corner uh, of the house. They killed them one after another. They killed a total of 125. And then they torched the village because it was 
uh, a farmer's village and there was a lot of hay on the roof of the houses. So they torched the village and it became, you know, a big blaze of fire. Now, this happened 48 hours before a man called David Ben-Gurion would stand in Tel Aviv on the afternoon of 14th of May, telling people, I mean, declaring his state, uh, settler state, and calling upon Palestinians to be peaceful and not to resort to violence. I mean, this is the height of hypocrisy. Um, so um, I, I, of course, uh, tried to trace my, uh, our old uh, teacher, school teacher, and I knew his um, family and friend, and we gathered the pieces here and there. And, but what is surprising even more, a man called Zipper, he was one of the Haganah who attacked um, that village. He wrote in his memoirs that we were like beasts. We are killing every, every living thing in there. He, in a candid manner, very strange, he published it later in South Africa. Uh, South Africa. He described how, uh, he said, we did not feel they are human beings. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the epitome of what Israel uh, uh, did. Um, uh, you are right that it was not written about before, but 24 hours later, they came and attacked us in Al Ma'in, which is about 30 kilometers south. Um, and uh, they attacked us in, with 24 uh, armored vehicles. And we had about 10, 15 people carrying rifles, uh, 24 armored vehicles. But we held them till the morning. They came in about three o'clock in the morning. We held them uh, till about noon. And meanwhile, they demolished everything. The water mill, um, uh, which my father built called Bayara, they demolished it, the well and the farm. They demolished that school, which my father built in 1920. Mm -hmm. They torched all our houses and burned them. Um, so this, is, this was exactly uh, just before 15 of May, 1948. So all this has been carried when there was no Israel and there was no provocation. And these people came actually to do what I call the Zionist invasion of Palestine, which as you know, know very well, started in uh, April 1948 for six weeks. They depopulated 220 villages, including the main cities in Palestine, Yafa, Haifa, and later Akka, and of course, uh, Safad and Tabariya, the first one. Um, so well, the, this is the Zionist invasion of Palestine. Mm -hmm. The great lie when they say we were in a state of self-defense against the Arab invasion of Palestine 15 of May, 50, mm -hmm. or 15 May. This is a lie. The truth mm -hmm. is uh, they were not in self-defense. They were the aggressors. And when the massacres of year seen, we listed 55 massacres in this period alone. Uh, the news came to Arab countries. There were demonstrations in Arab capitals. And people said, go to help Palestinians. By this time, half of the refugees were expelled by the Haganah, which was not a state. And then they came and they were, did a poor job, disorganized, not unified. And so Israel took the, the rest of Palestine. You, you know, Salman, people use documentary evidence about 1948, especially Israeli historians or historians in the West, especially. They look for archival sources, but it was really us. Palestinians who documented through oral history the large number of massacres. I mean, if you look at archival documents, you can talk about 25 massacres, but if you look at Palestinian oral history, what we've done in the last 30 years, we can talk about 7,500, perhaps even more massacres. Practically every village had some sort of mini massacre, execution of people, um, especially young men. So it's really us doing it, isn't it? I mean, us bringing the whole history of Palestine, the whole history of the, the Nakba, um, completely differently, and, and um, not just relying on archival sources, whether it's colonial archival sources. So I think what we do is incredibly important. I just want to take you back to the issue of education, because I looked at your autobiography and education is a big part of it. There's a chapter about education. There is your education in Cairo. 
there is your arrival as a refugee in Gaza almost with net nothing, with very little. And you also men mentioned Ismail Shamut kind of struggling um, to make a living and a lot of people. I mean, these vivid accounts of, of the refugee situation. And then you talk about education, uh, education in Egypt, education in Cairo. Uh, also, we have uh, the rise of Abdel Nasser in Egypt and how education was a big part of our recovery as a people, as a nation. And that, ed that education recovery, in my opinion, I just want to tr try to locate you within the wider history of Palestine after the Nakba. Because people talk about the PLO in 1964 and then the Fidaiyin organization in 1968, but the 50s is incredibly important because this was a, an educational revolution a lot of the people who were educated in the 50s were refugees. And many of these people actually ended up in the Gulf and also ended up educating many Arabs in the Gulf and ended up setting Arab universities in the Gulf. The role of the refugees, I mean, you are a refugee, Salman, aren't you? The role of re refugees in terms of recovery, recovering Palestinian collective history, memory, resisting back in the 50s is incredibly important. This is really, you know, it's almost a decade before the founding of the PLO, the 64 and 60s. The 60s, the more radical organization, uh, part of the UN. We're talking about a decade, which is incredibly important in terms of Palestinians taking the initiative. In uh, Kalila and Dimna, very famous story, there's a, a, there's a little story about who's going to ring the bill, Maniqra al Jaras. We did it. We really did it in the 50s in terms of starting to reorganize. We have to remember that they tried to wipe, wipe out Palestine in 1948. It wasn't just about expelling individually. It was wiping out a living country, a country which has been there for thousands of years. It's a living country. It's not just about 500 villages. It's not about, people talk about 750,000 refugees. They really try to wipe out the country from the map. And you are talking a lot about maps. Look at the maps of the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. It's almost like Palestine doesn't exist. Even on Google's map today, we don't see Palestine there. It's still that denial. But we really had to start from that recovering from education. So you're talking about education, people educating themselves as individuals and you went to Cairo, and, the, and, and from Cairo, you also ended up actually in Kuwait. So I think education, and also you mentioned the fact that your father started the school in 1920. Again, we, 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 we do, I actually think we are not an illiterate people. We, we, education was a big part of our history, by the way. We had colleges. But I think education is also a big part of your, your own personal history. And a big part of the way we empowered ourselves and we started to decolonize ourselves and to try to empower our mind. I think education is a big part of your story, Salman, isn't it? Highly educated mm. Um, mm. And, 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 and eventually writing all these books, producing all these maps, highly professional, highly technical. I actually see education as a big part of the way we have recovered after the Nakba. Um, you, you mentioned a number of points. I'll try to remember them all. The first one is education. Uh, there is no doubt, and I have personal experience of that, that um, in 1948, there was a great thirst for education. Um, the, if you actually see pictures, I, I, I have lived that, um, in 1949 and 50 in Gaza, young boys and girls actually sit under the lamppost of the street. They finish their homework under the lamppost because otherwise the refugees were in tents and there is no place to sit down and write. So they sit in, on the asphalt road, Macadam Road, under the lamppost and finish their homework. And um, Abdel Nasser is uh, uh, accredited greatly for allowing Palestinians uh, to go to Egypt and go to universities um, uh, free of charge. Uh, I have uh, the fortune 
to go to Cairo immediately after 1948 because my three brothers were studying already in Cairo University. It's called then Fouad First University. And in the, in the high school called Thaqafa and then Tawjihiyya, um, I happened to get the top marks of all students in Egypt and Palestine and Libya there were one examination, 30,000. So the refugees in Gaza were delighted. And the little newspaper in Gaza said, a refugee boy wins top marks. And um, so they were delighted because everybody felt that the education is the asset which Israel cannot steal from you. They can steal your land. They can make you uh, lose your identity, but they don't. Now, it follows, of course, education uh, brings back um, the, uh, the, the, your identity into focus. Why? Because um, uh, you need to convince the outside world of your case. You don't need to convince ourselves because we know this is our land. So you dig into the archives of the various countries and it's very well known, of course, that the Western countries, particularly in our case um, uh, in England, they, they maintain the records about our country. Um, so we go back to these and we document them. It's not easy because you have to collect them from so many sources. Um, and after all this time, we accumulated uh, an archive of 10,000 items from many countries and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, when you actually do that, I'm sure, Noor, you, you, you have been, we have been together in a number of things. When I publish my maps and figures and so on, very rarely any Israeli can, can uh, uh, confront them. Uh, while if you talk uh, politics, literary um, version of politics, they can dispute that. Now, um, what, what is interesting, which is not interesting actually, that the West who created Israel had the greatest number of documents about Palestine, yet they called it a land without people. I mean, I keep saying and showing map I have mm -hmm. submitted by the Zionist Commission to the peace conference in Versailles in 1919, showing Palestine hatched over all the cities and towns and uh, right, written on it, grazing land, only shepherds there. Mm -hmm. And who believed that lie? The Western countries which sent survey missions to Palestine and they made so many documentation of that. Mm -hmm. But coming back to our history, there are two aspects, as you will know, I'm sure. Number one, that the, the documentation which the West has, we now collect. Secondly, our oral history. Now, mm -hmm. our oral history has been ignored completely by the West. Only when some Israelis said there is some truth in that. And now when there are new files declassified in Israel, they say, hey, well, it seems that the Palestinians are right. We recorded 156 massacres and atrocities from January 1948 till about maybe 1956 when the attack on Egypt took place. Now, all this, all this, uh, now became accepted if you really care to do that. Now, let me just mention one thing. The idea of history, um, um, the knowledge and appreciation of history is changing. I went to Geneva and spent some days and I looked at the Red Cross files on Palestine in 1948 and 1950. And I found that the Jews, we call them Jews so that the name in the British mandate documents, they were Arabs and Jews. The Jews actually, in 1948, set up concentration camps for captured farmers from occupied villages, and they put them into forced labor, forced labor, exactly, exactly uh, in the regular notion of a concentration camp and forced labor. And they visited five of those uh, concentration camps and wrote about them wrote about them very mildly because the uh, Swiss uh, do not really want to uh, you know, exaggerate things or they don't want to be blamed for this. Now, what I did was, it's very simple. 
I went around and tried to trace some of the people who were in these concentration camps. I found them in Galilee, found them in Jordan, in Syria, mm -hmm. and, and, and we had, um, you know, we had evidence from them. The question in my mind, Noor, mm -hmm. why did these people not speak about this? Mm -hmm. Why? Because the notion of concentration camps and forced labor camps was, was not legally and uh, in the minds of people was known to be as a crime. When I asked them, why didn't you complain? Why didn't you write about this? They said, well, the Jews are enemies. They can do anything to us. They were engulfed with the trauma of being expelled from their homes by this new enemy who came from Europe. And that description of his crimes against them doesn't need to uh, explain or anything. Uh, but even uh, this is important because now we know concentration camps is an evil and mm. to be committed against Palestinians by those who have uh, a history of that is amazing, is amazing. What's amazing actually is that most of the officers of these concentration camps were uh, uh, from uh, the extremist part and they have German names. We have the name Molman, Schneider, and so on. They came from Europe to carry out these concentration camps and to run them. You know, my father was one of those people in the um, uh, detention camps, they called a uh, Mortakal. And he was kept there 50 years. My uncle was there. They picked up every single young um, Palestinian surviving after the Nakba. Those people who stayed, who who the, um, the, the people from within the Green Line um, and all the young people actually were taken to the, these detention camps. It's true that we Palestinians haven't written about al-Mu'taqal, Mu'taqalat, uh, but in fact our fathers and our relatives actually were talking about it all the time to us. I mean they were describing uh, vividly in details what happened to people within these um, co co uh, detention camps of concentration. I, I, in fact, we, in terms of knowing about them, we did know quite a lot about them from, from father to son, from uncle to, um, but we, it's true that we haven't actually written enough about this subject. I, I just want to take you back to the um, autobiography and the whole question of um, uh, self-biography and personal history because we have been doing it quite a bit. I think Ramzi Baroud uh, wrote something about it, uh, this personal family history, this is an important part of it. But, it, but actually there is more to it. So there is the whole question of what I call self-representation or self-recording, what Rosemary Sire talks about all the time. I think she alerted me to the fact that we need to record it. It is important not for the others to record the truth, but free for us, for ourselves, for our own children, for our own generations, down the line, generations after generations, we need to record these things. So this question of self-recording and self-instituting and self-constituting, if you like, is so central because of the denial of our own existence. We are not a people. We are just individuals. We're just Arabs who happen to live in Palestine. We are not a people, collectively. So the question of how we record, not waiting for others to do it for us. The question of, I think Saeed talked about self-representation, how, how important. We were not allowed to represent ourselves until, until we came, until Edward Said came and said, we self-representation is fundamental to the way we write our own history, we constitute we institute our own institutions. We create, we, we do it unless we do it. It's not just about the truth. It's about who does it. This is where the Palestinian agency, the Palestinian individual agency, which you and I and a whole range of people have been doing it. And also the Palestinian collective agency. If we don't do it, nobody's going to do it for us. Not just about discovering the truth about these atrocities, it's about Palestinian recording them, teaching them. Our younger generation don't know enough about these people. I mean, I have been 
um, visiting and talking to an awful lot of young people, these students actually on the West Bank, who have no idea, some of them, about these things. But it is important that we do it. And if we don't do it, nobody's going to do it for us. And this is a big part of what you're doing and the whole idea about autobiography as a way of uh, self-record and also as a way of resisting, as a way autobiography as a form of resistance which is a, it's an important part of your book. Let me take you slightly to, to, to speed up the whole thing to the project of your life, which is return and, uh, and restoration, if you like. I mean, you've done so many restoration projects about from the maps to the villages to um, looking at the practicalities of return to the new center in Beirut, which is an exciting development. I, I think some people have noticed this center, but maybe others. Do you want to talk more about these restoration projects? And, um, and I think it, in this sense, perhaps your work is unique, or you, perhaps your work is so, if you are cutting edge in terms of restoration projects. I mean, we historians have documented things, but you have gone beyond that you talk about how we are returning, not just returning mentally, not just returning intellectually in terms of consciousness, but also mm -hmm. practicalities, how we do it. So do you want to highlight this issue of them? It's really the, the project of your life, isn't it? The project of the last 30 years you've done. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, um, as an engineer, I have tools, maybe not available to literary figures or things like that, but maps are uh, documentation. The map is the birth certificate of the land. And in the uh, history, it's always uh, mapping is um, an, a recognition of who owns this land. So when we collected these uh, maps and these documents, actually, I have... Uh, all the British mandate documents, which are reports and uh, uh, figures and facts and so on. Uh, we know that Palestine is our country and the West have been blinded by the Zionist propaganda saying that Palestine is a land without people or there are very few people there or whatever like that. Now, um, we, the destruction of 560,000 villages is unprecedented in Palestine uh, Palestine history, your book, 4,000 years history. It's unprecedented. There are always kind of invaders, they come and go, but to obliterate physical traces of the people and then wipe them out from history and geography, this is unprecedented. So we have to put ourselves back on history and geography. The first thing to do, not to convince ourselves, maybe to teach our children, but also to teach the world which have been uh, duped by this. Now, we know that the right of return is our right. We call it sacred in the heart of every Palestinian. And of course, it's legal by every article of international law. And we say now it is feasible. Why I say that? Not because we convince ourselves that my land, which is only one kilometer away from the armistice line in Gaza Strip, not to convince us, but to convince the world because the, uh, the, the Jews, I call them because they were Jews before 1948, they tell the world, now we destroy the villages, the place is full. Are you going to create a new Nakba for, for Jews? Which is, this question is really immoral and racist. If someone mm -hmm. goes into your house, kills your family and take your house and then say, you can't push me out because I already live there. This is not acceptable. But even, even that argument is not valid. We made a study of the following. All the Palestinian refugees, from which village they come, their names, where are they located, in which camp today, and um, how many are they, and what is their land property, village land. And then we said, all right, who lives there in their land today? We have smattering of uh, settlers and so on, as you well know, most of them are around Tel Aviv and Haifa and Jerusalem. But we found 472 
village lands are empty of Jews today. Half of them completely empty, and the other half have kibbutz who compose or comprise one to two percent of the Israeli uh, Jewish population. And so when we actually studied them, there were no very few cases of displacement or overcrowding Palestinians over Jews, as Mahmoud Abbas was afraid that Palestinians will flood Israel. Uh, we, we don't have that. Even if it was true, like in Bosnia, all these second occupants must leave. But there is very little uh, displacement, very little. 88% of Jews live in 12% of Palestine. If you take their residential area, 12% includes road, parks, and so on. If you take a residential area where they live physically, it's 2.5% of Palestine. Mm -hmm. And so we then plan routes. How well, each village, where they are, in which uh, camp they are in Jordan, Lebanon, how they can go, what route they follow, how long the distance is, and uh, where, where, and not only that, we have found that practically all Palestinian refugees in Gaza can walk back, walk back on their foot to their homes. And they are 400 and, uh, sorry, 274 villages in Southern Palestine. 50% of Palestine was their land. Now they are in 1% of Palestine, which is Gaza Strip. So they can simply walk. The distance between Gaza and Al Khalil, Hebron, is about 45 kilometers. If you walk now through them, you hardly find maybe 500 or uh, against 2 million Palestinians, 500 uh, Israeli settlers. And the same thing if you talk, uh, walk from southern Lebanon to Jenin across the Galilee, you will find that there are few um, kibbutz there, but half of the people in Galilee are Palestinians, as you know, as you know very mm -hmm. well, and so on. So it's absolutely feasible. What is yeah. stopping them going back is, of course, Israeli Zionism and its mm -hmm. support by Western countries, namely USA. So mm -hmm. it is actually an armed war against Palestinians. It has nothing mm -hmm. to do with law, nothing to do with feasibility, nothing to do with right and wrong. It's really enforced uh, like, like World War II, it enforced crimes against Palestinians. Yeah, there are two dimensions to this issue. One is the fact that we're talking about third generation of refugees uh, and, and uh, an awful lot of people actually who are born um, in camps outside Palestine, people who haven't seen these villages and towns. So what you're trying to do is to reconstruct some of these sites. And I noticed some Palestinian, other Palestinians have tried to do um, this for a number of villages, but you've done visual things. I mean, things which can educate people, uh, things which can connect, not, not the first generation, of, not the Nakba generation, because the Nakba generation, most of it actually has, is no longer with us. But in fact, the third generation. So do you feel there is a kind of impact of these visual reconstruction um, uh, is the visual side of things on the younger generation. Yes. Do you actually feel it? Yes. The second question is the question of return within the wider vision of Palestine as opposed to um, uh, the so-called two-state solution disappearing um, very fast. Um, the idea of um, Palestinian statehood in, in the West Bank actually been diminishing less and less likely to happen. <coughs> so there's a, there's a whole wider issue debated now about the future of Palestine and the Palestinians within, within um, these visions and people are reorganizing. And, and, and I, I think your work is also relevant uh, to, um, to the third generation refugees, people who need to see these villages physically, the are physical, because an awful lot of people can't actually visit. I mean, you had, you had a foreign passport, you went there in 1995, I think. But most Palestinians actually don't have access to most of Palestine. They can't see these villages. So the question of what you do in terms of 
visuality and reconstruction of sites and towns and villages and houses and uh, the, vis the visual side of it, I think is incredibly important in terms of keeping um, um, the, 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 this issue, um, uh, reviving this issue or keeping it with us actually for us for the next generation. I mean, I think we have to think not just about ourselves, uh, but about the yes. next who's going to take over, who's going to carry on actually doing these things. And, and the question of um, wider vision for Palestine, um, you know, Palestine is not just um, from El Khalil to Jenin, if you like. Um, those people who try to propagate that idea. So there, there are practical implications and also there are um, political implications for the, um, what we call the restoration project you're working on. Mm, yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that. Very, very excited about that. Um, five years ago, we started uh, a, an annual competition uh, between uh, young Palestinian artists about to graduate. And they have usually, as you know, a graduation project. So instead of just taking any other example, we agreed with about 10 uh, Palestinian universities and in Lebanon and Jordan as well, that let the students choose their graduation project, one village, uh, destroyed village, and uh, try to reconstruct it. And now um, this is our fifth year, and we are very excited about how these young people, let me tell you a personal uh, story of someone. The winner last year is a young girl called Rula, and she got the first prize. By the way, all the architectural projects are judged by international jury in London uh, by uh, president of, uh, 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 Royal Institute of British Architects and from Germany and Ireland mm -hmm. and all that. So her project was to reconstruct the village of her family. Her grandfather told her we are from Kula. So what she did was, like every other student, of course, but she got the first prize, she reconstructed the village again. We gave the students data about their village. We gave them how it was, aerial photos, number of people, what they did, and we gave them also advice how it should be like, the number of population today, and what they should do, and uh, the number is nine times more now. They have more schools, more hospitals, and so on, more occupation. And all the jury every year are amazed by the creativity of those young Palestinians who really reconstructed in terms of drawings, engineering drawings, how to rebuild their villages. So even when refugees return home, even they have the ability by themselves to rebuild their village again. And not only that, this can be done entirely. We calculated how much it costs, how many people, we have enough engineers, we have enough labor to do it. And just as a historical note, uh, Noor, I would like to say, in our, one of our maps, we have the maps of Eusebius, uh, with the Bishop of Eusebius, who was Palestinian bishop ordained in Caesarea, Palestine, in the year 313. He left for us, he left for us a book called Onomasticon, and he lists these villages in Palestine uh, in, in order to help pilgrims who are going to Jerusalem. So we took these names and took these maps and they were actually the same names we have in Palestine in our new atlas 2,000 years later. So no, I, 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 I claim that there is no European country can claim that they have towns and villages which are on record for 2,000 years. So mm -hmm. when these young people re, rebuild their villages, uh, they are really rebuilding history and they are really correcting the crime of, of obliteration of Palestinians' history and geography. And I, I have great faith uh, in the future with these young people. Thank you, yeah. Uh, Eusebius, I do mention him actually in my book, um, 4,000 Year History, and also mention him in my forthcoming book, 
about Palestinian uh, learning and um, historical learning, geographical learning. Um, so there's a lot about um, this subject which we can we can do more. Now, your most recent project in Beirut, the new center in Beirut, um, that's a big project. Um, and you gave the uh, inaugural lecture, um, the first lecture, and um, it's again in Beirut. I mean, Beirut has been quite interesting. Beirut uh, was um, uh, the key site of some of the early Palestinian centers, um, uh, Marquis al Abhas and Marquis de Dirasat, founded in the 60s, even before the PLO was founded. So you located uh, the new center of the American University in Beirut. We've got the skills there. We've got the Palestinian oral history project also in Beirut. Um, you know, I'm, I mean, we've always been very proud of uh, our um, uh, uh, friends and partners in Beirut. And, and Beirut has, been, has always been a big Palestinian and being a being big Arab intellectual center. There's no question that Beirut was leading, still has got a lot to give. Um, the question is, how much can we, do we collaborate with Palestinians? Uh, you know, we have um, Palestinians on the West Bank, we have centers on the West Bank, universities on the West Bank. We live in exile, we have centers in exile. Uh, we have a Palestinian festival um, run from New York from exile, we have Palestinians. So how much as a people we get together and work together. I mean, I know individually we are incredibly creative, you and I and many, many Palestinians, but how much do we need to get together to do things, to link up? I mean, we can see the fragmentation, we can see the isolation of Gaza. We publish a book, people keep asking, is it in Gaza? Can it arrive in Gaza? And when do I get in Gaza? How do I get in Gaza? Even People who live on the West Bank sometimes they say, well, you know, where do I get it? How do I get it? That physical uh, restriction mm. we're facing, you know, in, especially in Palestine, and how to regroup in Palestine, because we're talking about return, isn't it? I mean, it is important to set up things in Beirut, perhaps away from the Israeli occupation, if you like, away from Israeli uh, confiscation of our archives. Um, but, but we, we also need to link up, isn't it? And to regroup and to, um, and to empower ourselves collectively. Do, do, you, do you feel that collectively we are doing enough? Or do we have, um, we can do more? Um, and, and, and any ideas about how collectively to bring all these exciting projects we're doing um, in, in Beirut, your new project in Beirut and, and, and link it with the way other Palestinians um, are highly talented, but they're looking for things to do. Well, thank you for bringing that up because um, uh, the idea of this uh, um, center, which is Palestine Land Studies Center at the AUB, is exactly that. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, most of the documentation about uh, Palestine is, was in the hand or still is in the hands of the colonial powers. Uh, and so what we collected over 20 years or even more than that uh, should be available to uh, students, Palestinian students and Arab students in a place where they can reach. Uh, as you know, it's difficult to get a visa to England or to USA and cost them a lot of money. And so why should they go there to learn about their country when it's possible to have them uh, here in Beirut. The centers uh, which have been built in Beirut, research centers are very valuable, but our center is different. It is scientifically based uh, center, uses GIS, use population studies. Um, it doesn't deal very much with uh, political analysis or that. It deals with facts and that's why from that we could create um, scenarios for future Palestine, how it's going to be built uh, and, and so on. And um, the, 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 I take advantage of this uh, uh, discussion to say that all Palestinian students or Arab students who are interested in Palestine anywhere within, within 500 kilometers in Beirut should take advantage of this center. As you know, Noor, I wrote to you and wrote to many uh, others of my friends 
Palestinian scholars and even other scholars, inviting them to contribute their expertise. And so in, 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 in time, I hope this will be a, a center uh, for, uh, for building future Palestine or restoration of Palestine. Um, we have much more um, uh, faith and we have much more uh, right to do that than a man called Herbert, some, uh, sorry, um, uh, Herschel, who was sitting in a London, uh, sorry, he was sitting in a Vienna cafe um, in 1900, saying to Jews, I'll build the state for you uh, in a place he never saw. Now, we don't say that. We don't uh, uh, create Palestine in the Indian Ocean. We simply say we have to return to Palestine, which is within walking distance. And we have to prepare the wherewithal to do that to, for ourselves and for the world. Uh, the, I just want to conclude by saying mm -hmm. it is extremely important that the, the minds <clears throat> of our children, young people, should be occupied by the knowledge about Palestine because the Zionist uh, uh, forces and Israel have waged a military war against us to take over the land. And now they are waging a war against us to occupy our land, uh, our minds. And to occupying the minds, they succeeded in some uh, Arab rulers, but we should not get this disease to reach the minds of our young people. And that is very important now for them to know about their country. I hope this center will help to do that. Thank you very much. We, we have a, a couple of minutes actually left. Uh, has the center got a digital um, dimension? Can people ask, can students, graduate students, uh, uh, yes, can access yes, the yes, material? It's, it's, it's under construction. Sandra. There will be a database. There will be a database where you can reach any village, any place, historical, geographical, uh, and uh, as I said, in some degree of uh, 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 detail. Uh, uh, not only in the 20th century, 21st century. Also, we have, uh, as you know, the last atlas we made about Palestine in the end of the 19th century, uh, 600 pages in color. We also have maps about Palestine in 1596 which is the beginning of the Ottoman um, period. And of course, before that, um, Eusebius and so on. So all this data will be uh, in our website called Palestine Land Society. Palestine Land Society. Bil Arabi wal Inglisi. Hayat al Palestin. This will be accessible slowly uh, in the next uh, few weeks or months. And we already receive uh, requests from students studying uh, everywhere, and we give them the data we have. So, man, we're running out of time. You have been incredibly inspiring uh, to me and many people, and um, this evening you also have been very inspiring. Um, I'm really grateful, and a big thank you to um, to you, and um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you soon and working with the new center in Beirut. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I just saw, the, saw a note on the screen here. People want to know the name of the center. It's called Palestine Land Studies Center at the AUB, at the AUB. And the director is Dr. Huwaida Al Harithi. Um, you, you can look her up, and very soon you'll have a website where you can get information. But meanwhile, you can look at www.plands.org where you have much of the information there. And thank you for your interest. Thank you, Noor. It was always a pleasure to talk to a friend uh, where we understand each other quite well. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is not, it is not uh, a, contr uh, a contrary or contra a contrarian view, but uh, we, we are on the same wavelength, I'm glad. I'm glad Absolutely, and, and um, information about the center is also very useful. And a big thank you to um, the organizers of the Palestine Literature Festival. And we will have more um, sessions actually um, on, on, on Palestine tomorrow and um, the next few days. Thank you all. Thank you all.